Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for Zooming in. My name is Marty Kaplan. I am on the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism's faculty, and I also direct the Norman Lear Center at the Annenberg School. The Lear Center is named for Norman Lear, a legendary television writer and producer. If you saw the Golden Globes, you see that at age 98, He's still hitting the ball out of the park, making, making hit TV shows. And he is one of the master storytellers of our time. And storytelling is at the heart of what the Lear Center uh, studies and is about. Stories are the way that we imagine who we want to be. They tell us who we think we are. They can even affect our knowledge, what we know, what we believe, they can change how we behave. That kind of power in the hands of storytellers uh, can be used responsibly, or it could be used toward other ends, frivolous, malicious, you name it. And that's true whether the storytellers are in Hollywood or they are the species of storytellers that we call journalists. And it's journalists and journalism that is the world that we're gonna be looking at today. When journalists use their power responsibly, we wanna celebrate it and shine a spotlight on it and honor the best practices that they bring to it. And the one of the ways that the Lear Center and the Annenberg School over the years has honored best practices in journalism is by giving out an award. It's called the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Television Political Journalism. If you don't know who Walter Cronkite is, he was uh, often called the most trusted man in journalism. He was a longtime anchor for CBS and he's perhaps best known for his reporting in Vietnam, uh, which when he told the American people that we were not winning, we were losing the war in Vietnam, that so moved American opinion that it also affected the future of the Johnson presidency and, and the conduct of, of the war. Uh, Two years ago at the National Press Club in Washington, I had the privilege of being able to present the, to the winners of the Cronkite Award the last uh, uh, set of awards. And it was my great pleasure to uh, be able to announce uh, that Jacob Soboroff, our guest today, was the winner in the national individual category. And uh, what I want to do uh, is just read an excerpt of the award when, when uh, it was presented to Jacob. And this now appears on the back cover of his book, Separated, a New York Times bestseller. Um, Jacob Soboroff, went the citation, was one of the first national reporters to break the story on conditions of children separated from their parents at the border under the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. Though cameras were not allowed into the detention centers, Soboroff was able to explain the situation with clarity and descriptive analysis that was so power that was as powerful as any visual. His old fashioned reporting skills kept the story on the nation's agenda, and he stayed with the story doggedly over time. His coverage had an impact. It helped push the Trump administration into a rare policy reversal. So it's that kind of impact, that kind of craft that the Cronkite Award is meant to celebrate. And when I learned it was possible that Jacob could come and uh, be in our community, even virtually, I was thrilled. And the first person I thought of uh, in, uh, in order to make this the dream team perfect event was my colleague at the Annenberg School, Roberto Sura, uh, who is a polymath who has seen uh, this immigration issue and lots of others 
from every different angle as, as a working journalist in the field, as a scholar uh, of, journal, of uh, immigration and other issues, as the creator of the Pew Hispanic Research Center, as a, a faculty member also of the Price School of Public Policy, and if I could just brag, uh, in early years of the Lear Center, Roberto did a study of the news coverage of the debate over comprehensive immigration reform in the 2006, 2007 period, comparing it to 1980, 25 years before, and now 15 years later, he is on the case with us today, looking at the way journalism is covering uh, immigration. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that Roberto and Jacob will be able to have a conversation about his book and his work, and we'll get to know uh, uh, Jacob, and we hope this is the first of many times that you can be part of our community. Thank you so much for doing this. And Marty, thank you very much for, for arranging this event and for that kind introduction. And thank you also to the School of Journalism and its director, Gordon Stables, for helping organize this event. And of course, Jacob, thank you for being with us here today. Uh, Marty very aptly um, described the importance of the work that you did about um, events on the border during the Trump administration and how you chronicle them uh, in your book, Separated. Uh, I have to say, in terms of my personal reaction, um, a lot of the coverage, a lot of what you write about is covering breaking news and investigative reporting. Uh, but what I found most powerful about your chronicle um, is, in, per, in, to my mind, perhaps the most important uh, in singular function of journalism, which is that of bearing witness, um, of seeing things that are not meant to be seen, particularly when they involve human suffering, um, and, and being the person who sees what human beings can inflict on other human beings and bringing that to light. Uh, for any journalist, those experiences, I think, I'm certainly thinking about my own life, um, are the ones you carry with you um, forever. Um, and you wrote about that whole process very vividly, uh, very tellingly. Um, and I want to begin um, our discussion um, with the lead to the story, um, literally the beginning of the book, uh, which is an author's note. This is a confessional book. It's a first person narrative. Uh, and it begins in a very intimate way. Um, and I'm wondering, Jacob, whether I could ask you just to read your lead, the first paragraph um, of the book. I, I'd be happy to, Professor Searle. I want to just say thanks to you before I do, and, and thanks to Marty and to Gordon and to everybody at Annenberg. Um, this is really cool for me. I didn't get into USC, so this is as close as I'm going to get, not because of any of you, but uh, I don't think the application uh, was up to snuff. Let's just put it that way. And uh, so this is really fun for me. And it's good to be reunited with everybody at Annenberg. Um, I, I remain forever grateful for the, the Cronkite Award. And, um, and honestly, that experience, actually going through that after reporting on separations um, and, and the encouragement that I got from everybody at Annenberg is part of the reason that I put you know, the citation on the back of the book and why part of the reason I want to write the book is there were so many unanswered questions still for me, even, even after you know, that time period of reporting. And I think, I think you're right. I think that that's what I get into um, in my author's note a little bit. And I'll, I'll just, I'll read just the beginning if that's okay. Um, I called the author's note facts on the ground. Um, and, I, and I begin it this way. I said, I am an unlikely eyewitness to one of the most shameful chapters in modern American history the Trump administration's deliberate and systematic separation of thousands of migrant children from their parents was according to humanitarian groups and child welfare experts, an unparalleled abuse of the human rights of children. The American Academy of Pediatrics says the practice will leave thousands of kids traumatized for life. I was there to see it myself, though I didn't expect to be, and as a journalist, almost missed the story entirely. 
what I saw now is forever seared uh, into my memory. And that's how I start the book. Well, and, and you deliver on that promise. Um, and so maybe let's unpack a little bit of, of what is in that first paragraph. Um, so you call yourself an unlikely eyewitness. Um, tell us just briefly a little bit about yourself and how you got to that point in, in June 2018, which we'll get back to. Sure. Um, I, well, I thought that growing up in LA, um, you know, I was sort of the perfect guy to cover immigration um, quite pompously. I now, you know, think about in retrospect. Um, uh, when Donald Trump became president, you know, and I had not worked long at MSNBC or NBC News, um, it was the obvious issue to cover. And I thought growing up in California and in Los Angeles, which is a, a so-called you know, majority minority city, 50% Latinx population, like that's an easy story to cover in, in California, what the impacts of that would be. Um, and so at the beginning at MSNBC, I was sort of covering the fact checky, clickable headlines that I thought were the right immigration stories, you know? Um, do we need a wall? Do we not need a wall? What's life really like along the border? Um, is MS-13 really flowing into the country in the numbers that Donald Trump says, and what is MS-13, you know? Um, but in the, in the process of doing that, I missed this, I missed this story, family separations. I mean, I didn't know about um, the infrastructure of the American immigration enforcement apparatus. Um, I, I just, I'd never studied it. And I thought that immigration was, was a was an issue that that I could cover being a native Angelino without a whole lot of background in it. And let's just say the really obvious part: I am a white male, grow up with an incredible amount of privilege in Southern California. You know, I, my life couldn't be any further away from the Central American migrants, um, thousands of them as I write, children who were traumatized for life by being taken away. Um, from their parents by the Trump administration. And so when I say unlikely, um, that's what I mean. I shouldn't have been there. And the only reason I was there is that the Trump administration invited me there as part of a much larger border project that I was doing for Dateline NBC about all those things I mentioned. What's the reality of life like along the border? Big, a big fact check, sort of a know-it-all thing that we sometimes do in TV journalism um, of Donald Trump and his immigration policies. And I thought sort of, I was going to own them and I had his number, but in all doing all that reporting and I detailed in the book, I mean, I literally at times drove past some of the main sites of family separation without knowing that this deterrence policy, I didn't really even know what deterrence meant or what it was. Um, and we can get into all of that, but what, what I, what I missed and when I say I almost missed it entirely was the most extreme extension of a decades long bipartisan approach to immigration that treated human beings as criminals rather than as asylum seekers or, or at the most basic level as human as our fellow human beings. And in reporting this story, um, it, was a, it was a crash course for me. And the reason I wrote the book is that I didn't, I didn't understand how the government, how Donald Trump could have done this so easily. Um, but I reported out the book and I continued to follow the story after I was there in those breaking news moments so that I, and, and you know, the truth of the matter is there's a lot of people who are like me who didn't understand this. There are, there are plenty of people who do, yourself included. Um, and, and the reason I'm very upfront about why I was unlikely and why I almost missed it is because I feel like there were a lot of people in my position whose first real moral brush with the US immigration system came because of the separation of children from their parents. And it taught me a lot about what I didn't know. And I hope it teaches a lot of people who, who, who also didn't know these things, um, how, how not surprising this truly was. If you, if you know even a little bit more than, than what we learned in the summer of 2018. Yeah, and certainly um, previous administrations, including the Obama administration had used detention as a way of trying to convince people not to come. I mean, very explicitly had said, you know, don't come because life will be hard for you if you try. Um, and in fact, 
the current administration is still adopting yes. that basic idea that um, the, the, the difficulty of pressing an asylum claim is a, is a way of convincing people not to make the trip to the border and, and seek admission. Um, the Trump administration escalated that um, in a way that really has had never been seen before or since um, in using um, a footnote of American policy basically um, to justify legally in their own minds um, taking children away from their parents. Um, so this has been going on, now we know, thanks to your reporting and that of others, had been going on for some time, uh, unknown to the American public. Um, something really grievous had been done in our name as a nation, and we didn't know about it. Um, and then you stepped on stage um, in June, June 13th, 2018. Correct. Tell us about that, how that played out journalistically, how sure. you came in, uh, I mean, um, how was it you came to that, mm -hmm. to that place and time and then how those events unfolded? Well, um, and let me just back up and, and, and address something that you said, which is, this, you're exactly right. This is, and you know this far better than I have, uh, I do, and I, I've read your, many of your writings about this exact topic, that deterrence has been a failed um, immigration controlled strategy of the US government uh, for decades under both Democratic and Republican presidents. Um, the reason I came to learn, um, and I'll get around to June 13th, but the reason I came to learn that Donald Trump was able to separate kids like that is because the infrastructure was there. The deterrence system was baked in place. And in fact, it was it was policy. It was border patrol policy called prevention through deterrence under Bill Clinton. It built the first wave of walls and infrastructure to send people through dangerous journeys into the desert, knowing that they would have to choose between taking quote unquote hostile terrain or, um, or turning around and going home. And guess what? They took hostile terrain and many people died coming to the United States. Same thing happened. George W. Bush becomes president. 9-11 happens. They create DHS ostensibly in the name of securing the homeland, but, but in so doing, exponentially increase the size of the Border Patrol. Um, Barack Obama deported more people than any president in U.S. history. Nobody likes to talk about that. But And largely, by the way, through cooperation agreements with local law enforcement in places like Los Angeles, which only recently ended their agreements to hand over people that end up in county jails. So Donald Trump, you know, walks in and um, deterrence didn't work. It never worked. People kept coming through all those presidencies. And what Donald Trump decided to do was adopt the, the harshest, most extreme deterrence policy of any president in American history, what Physicians for Human Rights later called torture and the American Academy of Pediatrics called government sanctioned child abuse. And that was the, the systematic separation of kids from their parents. And I show up, there were, as you said, many other journalists, including my colleague, Julia Ainsley, who uncovered the fact that the administration was considering the policy at the very beginning of 2017. Um, Caitlin Dickerson at the New York Times, Lomi Creel at the Houston Chronicle, they were all seeing the pieces of this uh, come into place. But I wasn't a source-based reporter at the time. I was more of a facts on the ground, features type television broadcaster. And so in the course of doing the Stateline Hour, I had secured an interview with Kirsten Nielsen, the Secretary of Homeland Security, in May of 2018. And in that meeting, in that room in the Ronald Reagan building, I met a young woman named Katie Waldman, who was a press aide to her. And we kept in touch about our hour that we were doing about what I thought was the reality of life along the border. And zero tolerance was announced at the very end of our production on that documentary. So I asked her a brief question about it in the room and we went our ways. And uh, around a month later, I got a call from Katie Waldman, who has since become Katie Miller, the wife of Stephen Miller, the chief architect of the separation policy, uh, inviting me to go as fast as I could to Brownsville, Texas, to a place called Casa Padre. And that was the 250,000 square foot former Walmart that at the time was keeping 
1,500 boys, around 1,500 boys, uh, 10 to 17 years old, inside 22 to 23 hours a day, uh, the majority of them for no other reason than they had been taken away from their parents. It was a, ostensibly a shelter run by Health and Human Services, which, which you know, the, the folks that are joining us today might have heard about in the context of this current increase in migration from Central America. But really what I saw was kids who were incarcerated. Um, I had been inside a state uh, prison here in California, Northern California, I've been inside county jails. And the first thing that occurred to me is that these kids, these kids are here for no other reason they were separated and these kids are um, locked up. And I went outside and I delivered that reporting. And by the way, Miller Waldman told me she wanted me to go in because congressional Democrats were going to be going in and she wanted me to characterize it and other reporters that, that joined me on the tour instead of allowing their political opposition to do so. It was the first look anybody had ever gotten at uh, the detention of separated children and the conditions that they were living in. And so I went outside and in an eight minute, a nearly eight minute live shot with Chris Hayes on MSNBC, I sort of talked about what I was seeing. And that led to, um, here we are now, 2018, 19, 20, I mean, three years of reporting on this exact topic, you know, followed very soon thereafter, after that experience of going inside the epicenter, as she described it to me, in McAllen, where the kids were kept in cages. And that was really the first stop on their, um, after being apprehended by the Border Patrol, the separation and the journey that so many of these kids were, were sent on and are still on today. Yeah. So let's go back to that, that day in June, 2018. Um, you didn't know what exactly you were gonna see when you- No idea. And arrived in a great hurry, um, had, had to literally buy a notebook along the way. Um, was, Here it was, is. This is the notebook I bought. Yeah. You know, well, and that goes back, you know, to that those moments of bearing witness. Yeah. I I I still have notebooks from those moments. Um, so you you get called to go into this former Walmart. Um. Tell us about your feelings when you stepped inside and when you first saw what you saw there? Um, overwhelmed. Um, overwhelmed, it's still overwhelming. And it makes the hair stand up on my arms to think about those experiences. Um, I, as I read about in the book, I, I landed at the airport. It was a tiny little airport. And I asked Arne Hakelow, the producer who I've worked with for years. He was driving to pull over at the Wal, Walgreens, I guess. Um, the pharmacy, because I, I was told no cameras inside and I'm used to using cameras, you know, I'm a TV guy um, and no recorders, no tweeting, no social media, no nothing, pad, pad and paper. So I'm not used to, and it's not, almost sounds weird now, but like, I'm not used to traveling with a pad and paper. Um, it's not how I work. And so I stopped and I, and I bought this um, and I, I walked and I just literally started taking notes. Um, and I mean, maybe I'll just read you some of them, but Please. Yeah, um, the lobby is like a spa. Um, the lobby is like a spa. We saw an ambulance leave at 3.51 p.m. Um, there was a note on the table that said to staff, if you encounter media, immediately notify the PD, which I thought was police department, but it's program director. I had the phone number of the person to call. Somebody said to me, "There's an, I'm not used to so many people here. It's an awesome place. It really is. Um, and that's when we sort of walked through the front doors of what would have been like the lobby of the spa. And a woman said to me, I wrote kids everywhere, Oreos, applesauce. Um, and she said to me, smile at them. They feel like animals in a cage being looked at. Uh, and that was shocking um, because there, actually there weren't cages in this facility. This was sort of the I went in the reverse order. This was sort of the nicer facility, if you could call it that. This wasn't the Border Patrol detention facility. This was the Health and Human Services shelter where there were child welfare professionals. And um, that began a, a, a lengthy tour where I saw a whole little world inside this Walmart. Kids in line for a cafeteria, in, in a queue for a barbershop, going to English class, playing video games, playing, doing Tai Chi, watching the, the, the Disney movie Moana in the lo loading dock of the Walmart. Um, it was really overwhelming. And it was, and, and even when I left, it was overwhelming because 
I re- I'll never forget this, and I haven't really ever talked about this, but I remember a tweet from, from Ara Bogato, a reporter at Reveal, who I really, really admire. And I had tweeted out that somebody said this to me, you know, smile at them, they feel like animals in a cage being looked at. And I'm just paraphrasing what I recall her tweet to have been, but it pointed out that there might be a reason they're looking at me that way and maybe not a journalist who didn't look like me. Um, I don't share experiences with those children and there are many others who did. And so I felt a, a sense of overwhelm. I also felt a sense of insecurity about being the person who was in our business, we call it in position to tell this story. Right. But the only thing I knew how to do as a former advanced guy in politics was to soak up every last bit of information I could and tell it to our viewers. Um, and that, and that's exactly what I try to do. Yeah, but before you told to your viewers, you 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 get out of the place, you leave the place, no cameras, all you got is that notebook. Um, the first thing you did um, was write it for Twitter. I did, I did. And in fact, I put my feet up on the dashboard in the minivan that we had rented, um, and I and I opened this notebook and I just started tweeting the observations that I had written down in the notebook, and the thread um, exploded. I had never done anything on social media that got that much attention to this day. I don't think I have. Um, it, all of us, I mean, all of us, all of a sudden, and I mean, all of a sudden, I had like twice the amount of fifty thousand more followers. Um, because of what I had written online. And it start, and this, this started to explode in a way that I was not really prepared for. Um, right away. Right away. Right away. And, and so you even included the lead of the story. I mean, buried in one of the tweets. I mean, the great phrase, these kids are incarcerated. Yep. Which was a journalistic conclusion about yep. what you had seen. I mean, that wasn't just descriptive. That was drawing... And oh, very much so. And, very, and, and I was worried about that. I mean, I was worried that my bosses were going to call me and say, hey, what the hell are you doing? You know, like, because the truth of the matter is actually about that facility at HHS, they are allowed to technically walk outside and leave at any time. Um, and in fact, children do. And then they often call the police to report a missing child and bring them back. So literally, they're not incarcerated. They, they have the ability to walk out. But for me, the reason I drew that conclusion and, and said it and was comfortable saying it was they wouldn't have been there for any other reason than they were literally taken away from their mothers and fathers when they crossed the border. And they were told, you stay here until we find a family member in the interior of the U.S. or a sponsor to place you with. And it could be days, it could be weeks, it could be months. And nobody knew the answers. I mean, nobody could answer my questions, even the facility officials who had never been in at the center of an experience like this. And so while the doors literally were not locked for the kids to walk outside, um, they were, everything about that experience said to me, these kids are incarcerated. And so this is, let's stay with that moment for just a minute. Um, so you, you see this, you draw this conclusion and you tweet it in a thread that is kind of you know, I mean, it's not in order. It's no, not, it all over the place. It's all over the place. This line is buried in the middle of a tweet. It's not the, you know, it's not the, the lead of a tweet even. Correct. Um, and then this is exploding online when you know you're about to, you're, you, you've not delivered to your bosses yet. I mean, you're, you're, you haven't yet gone. Kind of against policy what I did actually. I mean, yeah, I mean, you broke the news yourself. Yeah. Online. And then and then go live with it yep. in, in what is now, you know, it is in the, in the, in the current age, um, you know, a peculiar form of journalistic delivery, which is dialogue. Yeah. So you were right. working from a script. You didn't write a story. The, the, the tweets were, I mean, in reading your tweets and then reading the dialogue that, with Chris Hayes that followed 20 minutes later, it's very similar. I mean, use some of the exactly. same phrases, including that line, they are incarcerated, which goes from drafted on Twitter and then given to the I think world. that was the first thing I said to Chris, actually, if I remember, if I remember correctly, but you're right, it was in the middle of the, of the, of the Twitter thread. And you're so right to point this out that um, it, there was no nightly news script. It was in fact too late to be on NBC nightly news. It was eight o'clock East coast. Um, and also, I'm thinking to myself, man, it's an MSNBC live shot in prime time. 
reporter hit, which they never do. These things are normally two or three minutes long. And I got so much information that I want to tell Chris. And so I just, I think I reread the notes or I reread the Twitter thread before I went in. I mean, basically use Twitter to organize, even though it was disorganized in my head, what it was I wanted to tell in the spirit of an advanced man telling his boss, uh, tell Chris and our viewers. Yeah. And then we started, we just started talking. And I think it went, as I said, I think we went on for seven or eight minutes, yeah. which is like unheard of real estate for a primetime cable news opinion host to see to a, a reporter in the field. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see, read your account, which is quite detailed. Um, the, the Twitter basically served as your drafting process. It did. Um, for and I made a mistake. Hmm? I, I mean, I made, I made a couple of mistakes. Like I... I said PD, which I thought I had interpreted was um, police department, but it turned mm -hmm. out it was the program director. Um, and I also had said, uh, I guess in haste, that I had been inside a federal prison, but really I don't, I'd been in a state prison. And so, yeah, a, a couple of errors, minor factual errors, but but errors nevertheless, like made it into my initial um, my initial conversation with Chris. And then also very much, you know, in the in the manner that it's done today, but something that people have been doing since wire service days, you turn the story over again, and you turn it over again, you re-let it. You did it four or five times. You did a, a print piece. So describe for a little bit that process that lasted for almost another 15, 16 hours. It did. Um, of, of basically recycling material when you had no film no film only 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 my words and some handout footage that we were reluctant to use and in fact when i first came out with chris we didn't we didn't even have the handout footage yet they had said to us the government the trump administration we're going to give you footage from this tour but it never it certainly didn't show up in time for my my prime time head on msnbc and i think it finally showed up later that evening, around the time I was on Lawrence O'Donnell, two hours later, but you're right. I had to go back on and continually answer questions. I, I'll never forget that hit with Chris Hayes for the rest of my life because it was like I was talking to an editor or to, um, to just a curious viewer who had questions about what I had seen. It was like I was um, sorting through it all uh, live on the air in front of millions of people. You know, and he had the best questions. I always say this to Chris when I see him, like, I will, I never forget that night and I will never forget those eight minutes because some of the things I learned in that tour and I spoke about during those eight minutes are still the things I'm talking about and investigating and learning about to this very day. Um, and so, yeah, after I was on Chris, you know, then the assignment desk starts calling and they're saying, we need you for, for all these shows in prime on MS. We also need you to file a report for the Today Show live at 7 a.m. on the East Coast tomorrow morning. Um, by that point, I think I'm already like coming down with something. I thought I was sick. You know, like all of a sudden I'm just like, I'm gonna have a mental breakdown. Um, but I kept but I kept going back. It was almost almost no time to think about stuff, only to do. Um, and because there was so much to sort through. And so I'm I'm now starting to enlist other people the producers for the Today Show in New York who are gonna help me cut the spot. Um, Arnie on the ground to help figure out literally what we're gonna do next, where are we gonna go? And I just kept trying to study and replay in my head without the footage until we ultimately got it and never was it my own footage, how to characterize what I had seen. Um, also, don't forget, I'm not, as I said earlier, like I'm not a native, Spanish speaker. My Spanish was poor. I didn't get to have detailed conversations with people um, inside. So I, what I went back to was my, I never went to journalism school. Um, I went to, I, I was an advanced person, as I said, which is the job for uh, politicians and candidates who shows up before someone soaks up every last bit of information and turns around and tells them before they arrive what they need to know so that they don't have some kind of spectacular or embarrassing fail when they get there. Mm -hmm. And I like went to my muscle memory as an advanced guy. What was every single detail I could remember about what I saw, what I leave out of my notes, and how can I construct this now into 
something that I can use to describe to people what what in the in the press and other journalists have been talking about now for weeks, if not months, what it looks like on the inside of the family separation policy. And that was sort of the mission from there until it wasn't just 15 hours. I think it was like 36 hours later until I went home, had two days in LA and was called back to South Texas to go inside the epicenter where the separations were actually happening. So that first phase really was literally the act of bearing witness. You had seen something and you were remembering in your mind's eye and trying to convey something that was captured nowhere else except what, what you had seen and remembered. It's why I write about in the book how panicked I was when I started the project of the book and I went looking for this in my, there's a public storage, you know, um, facility, those orange places mm-hmm. around the corner from my house. And I started digging through all my stuff to try to find it because I thought to myself for a long time before I moved into this house from and now, it sat on my desk. I'm like, I can't lose this. What am I going to do? You know? Um, and I was, I was panicked. It's not an exaggeration. When I went to start to write the book um, to look for these notes. And, and when I found it, it was the most unbelievable uh, sense of relief because that that's where, I, that's where everything was. And my writing is so poor because I was writing like this as I was looking around like that, just trying to soak up every detail. Yeah. You, um, in, in describing the end of that sort of crazy blitz of, of story making and uh, that followed um, this moment inside the Walmart, um, you say something um, very personal um, that really rang true to me. And I could, I could, in, I could remember specifically having the exact same feeling um, in a s- similar circumstances many years ago. Um, and here, um, I'll read and, and then ask you to, to come out. Um, um, though nothing compared to what the families I was reporting on were going through, I found myself spent, emotionally shaken, and feeling out of it. Being with my family was all I could think about. Take us back to those feelings. And- yeah. Um, it was, well, I was, I, I was, I had, it was 2018. So I was the father of a two year old going on three, a little boy. And, you know, this was June 13, 2018. The second day I, you know, when I went back to see the epicenter was father's day, 2018, um, June 17th. And it was, I mean, I, I first process it. I'm, I first process everything as me, not as a reporter. I mean, that's just the truth, you know? And how do you not think of seeing, these were 10 to 17 year olds, but Lawrence O'Donnell, I'll never forget, asked me about, and Chris too. Well, that's 10 to 17 year old boys. Where's everybody else? And I never thought about it. I mean, I didn't think about it at the moment I was inside. I only thought about it when I was asked the question on the air. And I think I almost had like an out-of-body experience thinking, where are the um, Noah's, my son? You know, where are those children who came here and were separated? Um, And it was hard to separate, no pun intended, that me as a human being from, um, from this story that I was covering because I had my own kids and I, I'm, an, I'm still a new father, but I was, a, I was a really fresh father then and I just couldn't comprehend it. Um, and that's, I think, what got me thinking so much about going home, which I don't often do when I'm on the road. I mean, I love being on the road. And I think it was all I could think about for a while. Just an alert to the audience. Um, I'm, I've got a, just a couple of more questions. I'll let you go on all day with Jacob, but we're going to open the floor, go to chat. And if you've got questions, uh, please type them in and we'll, we'll get to them before we, uh, as best we can before we close out. So you touched on something there that, um, you know, is very relevant to a lot of discussions about uh, the coverage of issues relating to race and identity uh, in America today and the nature of journalistic objectivity and what that means. Uh, your personal feelings, your experience, who you are, um, as you've just described, was 
essential both to the, the, the way you responded to what you saw. Um, and if I'm hearing you correctly, there was kind of a straight line from your feelings yeah. as a human being to an audience of millions. When you, when you went live and just started talking unscripted. Yeah, it, and it taught me a lot about what I actually believe journalism is um, and can be and what's okay and what's not okay. Um, I think that, you know, we're trained, especially in television news, to, um, and I was fortunate actually, I mean, on the one hand, I wish I would have gone to Annenberg because there would be a lot that I, I didn't, um, there would be a lot that I didn't have to learn on the fly, you know? Um, but on the other hand, there was a lot that I didn't learn that is traditional. And I think that that's what's changing about, especially places like uh, like Annenberg. What, what traditionally might've been the messaging about being a television journalist and what I accidentally stepped into. I mean, I didn't do it on purpose. Um, and looking back at that experience, to me, I, I think that um, neutrality is often the word that's thrown around. Um, and I, I just don't think it's possible as a human being. Um, I no longer think it's possible. I think that you can't separate yourself from your lived experience. If anything, I hope that people um, that saw my reporting in real time back then, don't judge me on whether I was neutral or not, but whether I was fair. Um, and I couldn't separate myself from my, the way I felt about it. Um, to my boss's credit, they didn't pull me from this. Instead, they doubled down and said, keep going and doing what you're doing. Um, just be honest and just be transparent. And so that's what I try to do. And that's what I still try to do. I, I'm, I have plenty of opinions about what happened during separations and I haven't kept them a secret, even plenty of opinions and emotions about what I see happening today um, and the way politicians on both sides um, react. And so long as um, I'm looked at as a fair journalist, uh, I don't really care if people think I'm a neutral um, journalist. And it was something that took this story for me to understand about myself. I mean, all of us, uh, if you do journalism, even for a little while, um, you're going to encounter situations where you're seeing human suffering. It's, for better or worse, it's a lot of what we trade in yeah. is stories of human suffering. Um, and it's part of our role to, to cast a light on it. You touched on something very interesting. I mean, how... What does neutrality mean when you're seeing, and this was an extreme case, these were children, you know, which sort of escalates. Exactly. Everything. Um, what's, is there neutrality? I mean, is it even, does it, is it possible when you're seeing something like that? What is neutral? I mean, when it comes to, and this is, I learned very quickly on June 17th, 2018 on Father's Day, what is the neutral version of describing children caged after being separated from their parents? Could I have called it a backstop, a baseball backstop looking like thing? You know, could I have walked out and said there were chain link fences surrounding little young people? And, you know, it's like, what, what in the hell was I supposed to say? You know? So I came out and uh, with Casey Hunt on her program um, that she had uh, for quite some time on the weekends on Sunday night. I just said, I don't know any other way to describe it. There were kids in there locked up in cages, what looked like dog kennels. Um, and they're there because they were taken away from their parents by the Trump administration. And I did add in that broadcast that the, this facility behind me was here during the Obama administration. It was built during the Obama administration, but it was never used for the purposes that's being used for today, which is to rip parents and children apart. And there's no neutral version of that. Those are, I, you know, the author's note is called Facts on the Ground. Mitch Koss, who is my, my, my producer, but also one of my great journalistic mentors, always said to me, if you follow that um, 
a diplomatic and military sort of adium um, to just look for the facts on the ground, um, you're going to have a big head start in your reporting. And that's what I tried to do. And the facts on the ground were that kids were in cages separated from their parents. And there was no, there was no other way, no neutral way to describe the horror of witnessing that, you know? Yeah. And so two, two questions have come up from uh, our audience that have to do uh, with method here. Um, and one um, is uh, what you, uh, how you deal with an organization or government entity or per people who are trying to intimidate you uh, into not reporting what you see as the truth. Um, one kind of barrier, intimidation which certainly, um, you know, I first reported on the Border Patrol too many decades ago, and I don't think it's changed much. Yeah. Um, as with a lot of cops and a lot of military and a lot of government agencies, one of their the first tactics is intimidation. Uh, the other question also about a different barrier is a language barrier. Yeah. Uh, when, you're, when you're particularly, when you're trying to produce the testimonies of the people who are suffering the reporting that you're describing. Um, and, and that happens to journalists. I mean, I've faced multiple language barriers overseas where um, this is stock and trade, um, understanding how you overcome those barriers. So two barriers, intimidation and language. Um, on the language, you know, I, I, I'm certainly not fluent in Spanish. I would say I'm proficient enough to have a pretty good understanding and to be um, I don't want to overstate it. I mean, the truth of the matter is if you don't speak the la same language as someone else, it is a challenge. Um, you know, and it's not enough, honestly, to have someone by your side who's a good translator. it's 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 about spending quality time with people. And the father and son, Juan and Jose, who are in the book, I mean, I met with um, when the father was incarcerated. I met with him when he was released. I met with him and his son together at least three times over dinner in the Washington DC area. I mean, we, we, we are in communication constantly and we're both kind of learning with each other. In the short, um, in the short term, it's hard. Um, and that's where, um, for me, those initial experiences were as much about the conditions as they were about um, hearing from people. And in those instances, the government was trying to keep me apart from them in any case. Um, but I leaned on, and this is really important, other journalists who were there with me who did have those skills. Um, and there were plenty of them uh, in, the, in those facilities with me on those days. And, you know, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Like, yeah, I became... Um, associated with this story, but I was far from the only person on this story. And there are many, many, many other journalists who did a far better job in connecting on an individual basis with people who were um, torn apart by this policy um, for because of the depth and breadth of not only their language skills, but really because of their experience reporting on these issues. So, you know, it's not just language, it's a proficiency in the topic itself also. Um, and then when it comes to overcoming the feeling of intimidation, when um, an organization doesn't want us to be reporting the truth, for me, I never lead with narrative first. Like I never come up with the story that I'm going to do. I always uh, go to a place and the simplest way I can put it is take a look around. And in taking that look around, I'm, I'm immediately, I feel like I'm in the, in the, driver's seat, so to speak, because I've got those facts. And then it's fun in a way, not fun, not because, I mean, the topic is horrendous, but when it comes to holding people accountable, I was there and I saw it myself. And are you going to argue with what I'm, what I saw? And there is nothing better or as a journalist, more enjoyable than getting out of this room, which is my laundry room, but generally a studio and being able to go somewhere and tell somebody in power what I saw with my own eyes. Um, because it puts them on their, on me on the front foot and them on the back foot. And that's what, that's what I think journalism should be. Here's what I learned. Here's what I experienced. Um, you tell me why I'm wrong in what I saw. It, um, just as, as 
an aside, one of um, the, I thought, very generous and accurate aspects of the way, you, the way you've written the book um, is acknowledging and, and narrating all the, a lot of the other journalism that was going wrong around this topic and how you were functioning as, as one part of a much, what turned out to be a much larger enterprise with a lot of the reporters you named and, and others as well. I'm curious, just in, again, you know, the, the traditions of journalism or competition, getting your piece first, trying to scoop your competition, maybe not sharing what you know. Uh, those of us who've been in situations like this, in extremis, all the more so in conflict zones, um, very much know that those myths fall away with the first gunshot and you rely on your colleagues, your other, the other reporters uh, develop a kind of almost familial uh, relationship when you're particularly, as I said, in conflict zones or in situations like this where you're, you're fighting against uh, a very, you know, an administration that is telling the world that you're lying. Um, describe me a little bit of your relationship with your competitors at, at the height of this story. I see them as my um, as my my idols in a way. Honestly, I mean, people. I just saw Pamela Yates's question come through about the fact that I did become sort of associated with this story, despite the fact I had such a lack of historical understanding of how this all came to be. I mean, I always um, and I'll answer that question in a second. But like, I always look to the competition actually as a source of inspiration. Um, I am consistently amazed by uh, what I learned, honestly, from other people who work on this beat. You know, I'm not really even an immigration beat reporter. I'm sort of a general assignment um, features reporter for television. And so I learned, um, I learned and I continue to learn so much from them and I've got no shame in saying that. Um, you know, I'm more, this is like a therapy session. I talk about this in my therapy, like I'm insecure about, about, the fact that I have, you know, become so associated with this story and with covering this stuff, because there are so many people who have done it for so long and done such an incredible job. But the other side of that, to, to Pamela's question, is like, there also are not enough. And there are not enough people who have the lived experience covering issues like this or put in position um, in favor of uh, somebody like me getting a crack at this. And so while I didn't back away from it because there was something for me to learn and people like me to learn, but I also, I also learned about myself and about the people who I work with that in some measure, like I shouldn't have been the guy. Um, and while there were, um, while there have been, uh, while, every, while people beyond myself have learned from my experience going through this, whether it's journalism students or people who want to learn more about immigration, um, in a sense, it's like too bad that that has that is the case. That we all can't approach this from a knowledge base of having a deep understanding about this. So that's why I have such admiration for my colleagues, and also to Pamela, um, probably why I was in position and not somebody else. There needs to be more representation in this field. Um, so that next time, perhaps I'm not the guy who ends up in the middle of the story. Yeah. I mean, and, and and with all that, you know, I think it's still worth underscoring that something like this uh, requires a division of labor, uh, requires exactly. a lot of people doing different things. Um, policy experts can do something, policy reporters can do something, uh, but in this case, the role you played, that of bearing witness, yeah. um, requires, to my mind, um, a very specific set of attributes that you've described. Um, one of them is humility. Um, one of them is the practice of having eyes open, of being able to see details, and, and record them 
in your mind, the ability to be, to, to go from that visual cortex to words seamlessly in a hurry yeah. um, is, is something else. And the ability to get yourself into that place. I mean, somehow you kind of Tom Sawyer, Christian Nelson into letting you in there. It's my favorite part about this job is um, getting to go places to see things that otherwise so many of us wouldn't have the opportunity to do and to ask people questions that so many of us are thinking about and wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to do. And I love doing it live. Um, Whether it was walking out of the facilities or more recently chasing Richard Grinnell when he was spewing, you know, disinfo about the election in Nevada and being on the air live to do that and ask questions to his face. Like it is such an extraordinary privilege to have this job and to be able to, um, to be there, like you said, just to see things with my own eyes, you know? Yeah. And deadline is such a rush. I miss it so much. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a form of adrenaline that there's nothing else like it. That's right. Um, there's, um, as we're nearing the end of the hour, um, let's turn for a second to, to policy. Sure. Um, seeing, you know, the, the border is a big story again now uh, as we speak this very minute today um and has been for since you know some months and will continue to be um i've first wrote about a wrote first wrote a story about immigration um in 1975 (laughs) and it is crazy i hate i mean it's um it, it makes I'm not only old, but semi-useless to think that most of the s- dilemmas are the same. Yeah. I mean, it was about unauthorized migration and a plan to try and control it yeah. at the border. Yeah. Um, and um, so the question, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, I came up a little while ago in chat was like, you know, do you think that this issue can be solved soon? Um I mean, is there, and, and let me, there's, there's, there's the practical, there's the policy issues, but also there's the personal question. And let's keep this as a, at the level of a, of a journalist dealing with the story. How do you cope with a circumstance like this when you're sitting there going, you know, I was here three years ago and things are different you know, and, and they're better certainly in terms of the, the egregious and as you well put it, the human rights violations, um, but the broader circumstance that brings people to the border and the inability to manage them, the failure of policy, um, the, the, the repeated use of the same policy tools over and over right. again when they fail to produce the desired effect remains the same. What does it do to you as a reporter when you have to go back and it's like, okay, you know, I just busted my gut to tell this story. And here we are again. I think that, you know, there's a great tendency to, I watched the news and sometimes I participate in some of this over the course of the recent um, surge is what they call it or, you know, increase in migration is what it is. Um, and to treat it like a crisis, you know? And while I do think that there is a, a, you know, for sure an acute humanitarian crisis in the border patrol facilities where even the current DHS secretary says they're no place for a child, um, you have to put this all in context. And it's amazing because all the things I didn't know before separations that I know now, I look at what's playing out and I say, just as you said, professor, like, here we go again. Um, And while Joe Biden and his administration are using rhetoric that is lofty about creating a fair and safe and orderly and humane immigration system. And I think, I really do think they're coming at this from a good faith effort in reaction to the Trump administration's cruelty. 
to change these 30 plus years of deterrence as you have written about um, so well, they're not going to do it this week. They're not going to do it this year. And they're not going to do it this term. It's just not possible. Um, They're going to have to rely on some of the same things that you've outlined in the LA Times and New York Times, like leaning on Mexico to crack down on migration. And that's not fair, safe, orderly, or humane. Um, They're going to have to uh, ensure that no child is incarcerated by an apparatus designed to house people in jails along the border. Um, These things are not going to happen overnight. And I I haven't actually heard them pledge that that is indeed the intended goal. Um, I think that deterrence doesn't work. You know, we haven't heard them stand up and say that explicitly. And until there is an admission by uh, the president that the idea of scaring people away or enforcing people away from coming to the country, rather than looking at as you have been writing about for years, the root causes of why people leave, including climate change, by the way, which I went as I wrote the book and reported in the wake of the separations to see myself in Guatemala. Um, this is just going to happen again two years from now and again two years after that and again two years after that. And then maybe it becomes a different population of people. Um, but it's, it's a story as old as the immigration system itself and especially when it comes to our Southwest border um, over the course of the last three decades in which, you know, as Pamela pointed out and, and others, deterrence became the, the guiding philosophy of, of, of immigration policy. And that is an approach, as I said at the beginning, that treats people as lawbreakers and criminals rather than the, in many cases, asylum seekers or refugees that they are. So, What's it going to take for the rhetoric to match the reality? I'm not sure, um, other than time and policy. Um, and, and and we're not there yet. No, no. And, um, and there are lots of reasons to think that um, we've got difficult years ahead mm-hmm. um, in, in our own neighborhood, where, as you said, in Central America, we're seeing the effects of the slow effects of climate change, a long drought, combined now with the first time displacement caused by the sudden effects of climate change. Hurricanes, yes, that's right, exactly. I mean- 100 year hurricanes that happened within 15 days of each other. And and as you said, that's on top of- um, A pandemic. Pandemic, the, this coffee leaf rust, it sounds crazy, but literally the cash crop of the region, especially places along what's known as the dry corridor that run through these northern, so-called Northern Triangle, Central American countries, is a fungus eating away at literally at the livelihoods of people who have no other option. I was in a village, a rural village in Guatemala, where the World Food Program brought me to introduce me to um, parents where five children had died the previous year of malnutrition brought on by starvation because not only did they not have the cash crop, um, to sustain their livelihoods, but then they had no money to pay for supplemental foods that they needed when the foods they were able to grow themselves uh, dried out. And that's climate change, that's climate variability, like El Nino, like we have here in Southern California. Um, These are not things that are solved by locking people up in detention centers and telling them, we're gonna treat you very harshly. Stern things, I said this on The View the other day, no stern thing said by any president will convince any migrant who is desperate to turn around and go home. Um, nobody wants to leave. All you got to do is go there. And that's when it comes back to facts on the ground, you go there and you ask yourself and not a single person will tell you they want to leave or they want their daughter to pick up and take a thousands mile long journey, probably the most dangerous journey on planet earth in order to maybe have a chance of getting to Philadelphia to meet up with your auntie or your uncle. You know, that's just not how it works. Uh, it's not some racket that is being run against the American people. It is a true life or death situation, um, for, for many, if not most of the people that end up locked up in these places like criminals uh, when they're anything but. Jacob, this story has a long way to go. It does. And um, I think I can speak for myself and uh, everybody else who's taken part of this conversation and your, your audience at large. Uh, we count on you to be uh, our eyes and ears, and we count on your voice, your voice coming from your experience, the person 
you're willing to share with us, uh, more important than expertise um, is your ability, your empathy and what drives you to get to those places and to see these things. Uh, and then to bring that back to us um, is, I, I can sit here with all these books I can't do what you're doing uh, anymore. Uh, and um, and as I said, we count on you on this and, and many other stories to come and we count on you to come back to Annenberg where you've skipped over the student phase. And <laughs> I might back. have to re-enroll. I don't know after. No, uh... no, no, no. At this point, I'm, 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 I'm um, exercising my, uh, my in non-existent ability to create an honorary <laughs> faculty member. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And we'll, we'll continue to learn from you um, and we'll be continue to be enlightened by your journalism. Um, so thank you so much for all of your work and for being with us here today. Thank you, Professor. That means a great deal to me, more than you know. And uh, it's an honor to be here with you in particular and, and everybody uh, from Annenberg. So thank you. Great. And good day to everybody. Thank you for being with us. Take care, everyone.